Welcome to the House of Hypertrophy. Can you build muscle faster by training beyond failure with some of your exercises? A brand new study is the first ever to explore a distinct way of training beyond failure in trained individuals. Firstly, what distinct way of training beyond failure did they investigate? Some exercises are most challenging at the final part of the lifting phase, where the muscles are at a shortened length. For example, calf raises are hardest at the final top position. Pulling exercises like rows and pulldowns are also hardest at the final position. Free weight shoulder raises are hardest at the top, and certain leg curl and leg extension machines are hardest at the final position. We'll call these shortened position challenged exercises. If you train to failure on them, you fail at the shortened position. But you could go beyond by squeezing out as many partial repetitions as you can, resulting in you more effectively challenging the muscles at longer lengths. I've called these lengthened supersets in the past, but today I'll stick with the researchers' terminology and call them post-failure partials. A study last year demonstrated the potential effectiveness of post-failure partials. Untrained individuals trained the calf raise, one condition trained to failure with a full range of motion, stopping when they couldn't reach the top position. The other condition also trained to failure with a full range of motion, but kept going through squeezing out as many partials as possible aiming to fail at the most bottom position. That is, they used post-failure partials. Medial gastrocnemius growth was greater with the post-failure partials. However, there is a potential alternative to post-failure partials, and this paper, which also had untrained subjects train calf raises, demonstrates it. One condition trained with a full range of motion, a second with a lengthened partial, where you move through the half of the range of motion where the muscle is more lengthened, and a third condition with a shortened partial, where you move through the half where the muscle is more shortened. Gastrocnemius growth was greatest with the lengthened partials. Thus, instead of post-failure partials with shortened position challenged exercises, you could just use lengthened partials entirely. This raises the intriguing question, how do they compare? This is what the brand new study on trained individuals explored. Let's dive into it. Twenty-three trained individuals with an average of 7.3 years of experience were recruited. All subjects trained four sets of calf raises on a Smith machine, two times per week for eight weeks. With one leg, subjects trained to failure with purely lengthened partials in the 10 to 20 rep range, stopping when they could no longer raise to zero degrees. With their other leg, subjects trained to failure with a full range of motion and then continued beyond this by performing partial repetitions and stopped when they could no longer raise to zero degrees. Note that loads were adjusted accordingly so that per set, the post-failure condition performed 5 to 10 full range of motion reps and 5 to 10 partial reps, which was done to match the number of reps completed by the lengthened partials per set. Loads progressed over time as subjects got stronger to continue reaching failure in the prescribed rep ranges. Before and after the study, medial gastrocnemius thickness was measured. It was found that growth tended to be greater for the lengthened partials. These results are highly intriguing. Even though post-failure partials involved hitting failure twice in a single set, they were not superior to exclusively using lengthened partials. In the spirit of scientific accuracy, this is just one study on 23 trained individuals. Also, although they had an average of 7.3 years of experience, they generally tended to train their calves with low volumes. The statistical analysis actually failed to provide anywhere close to strong support for the lengthened partials being better than the post-failure partials. The researchers also reported relatively high measurement error. Thus, this paper is absolutely not what I deem robust or incontestable evidence. That said, I do suspect lengthened partials are great with car phrases. In the intro, the paper that found post-failure partials grew the medial gastrocnemius more than a full range of motion found a relative difference of 43.3%, while the other paper that found lengthened partials grew the medial gastrocnemius more than a full range of motion found a relative difference of 126.9%. This might serve as further indirect evidence of lengthened partials being better than post-failure partials. Also, this hints at a possibility we'll detail shortly, but there's evidence that the gastrocnemius generates greater contractile tension at longer lengths. As the authors of the new study describe, the fact that post-failure partials involve a greater proportion of time at shorter lengths, where contractile tension is lower, could mean it isn't as good as lengthened partials. 
All in all, I'd say it's a solid move to train the calves with length and partials. But what about other exercises and muscles? Allow us to explore three possibilities around length and partials. Firstly, regardless of whether we're talking about shortened position challenge exercises or other exercises, could length and partials just be the best range of motion to build muscle? We've already seen this study in 42 untrained women finding greater medial and lateral gastrocnemius growth from lengthened partials versus a full range of motion and shortened partial. There's a second study on 45 untrained women finding with leg extensions, lengthened partials tended to produce greater quad growth than a full range of motion and shortened partial. The biggest differences tended to be at the distal regions of the muscle, that's the regions closer to the knee joint. A third unpublished abstract finds in 34 untrained individuals greater overall glute and hamstring volume increases from lengthened partials compared to a full range motion with a machine hip extension exercise. But regular viewers of the House of Hypertrophy will know that more recent data doesn't look as promising. A paper by Wolf and colleagues last year recruited 25 well-trained individuals to perform an upper body program, one condition trained with a full range of motion on everything while the other condition trained with length and partials on everything. Biceps and triceps growth was comparable between both. A second paper had a large sample of 297 trained individuals perform a full body program. One group trained with a full range of motion on everything, while the other group trained with a length and partial on these select exercises. Arm and thigh gains were clearly not different between groups. So, length and partials may not be superior on everything. In the spirit of scientific accuracy, I don't believe we can confidently say this is 100% case closed. There is some controversy about the standardization of the length and partials in the paper by Wolf. The other paper, although having an impressively large sample size, did involve quite low volumes. Both papers also measured growth at the mid-regions of the muscle. But there's some indication that lengthened partials may be particularly effective for the distal regions of a muscle, so there are still open questions. The second possibility opposes the idea that lengthened partials are superior on everything, and instead suggests lengthened partials only work on specific exercises. We noted how there are some considerations with both the Wolf paper and this paper, but notice how they did involve exercises that aren't shortened position challenged such as Bayesian curls, triceps overhead extensions, and incline curls. These are moderate to lengthened position challenged exercises. Conversely, the three papers that find a lengthened partial to beat out a full range of motion generally uses more shortened position challenged exercises. Thus, perhaps lengthened partials beat out a full range of motion only with shortened position challenged exercises. Overall, this might be a real possibility, and there's no super strong evidence currently to refute or confirm it. The third possibility goes a little deeper and suggests lengthened partials are only superior with specific muscles, and the calves are a prime example. Earlier we alluded to how the force generating components of the calves cannot generate as much tension at short lengths, which is not necessarily the case for other muscles. So avoiding the shortened position for the calves through lengthened partials permits great attention and subsequently growth. Based on the limited evidence we have, the traps and pecs may also be like the calves. So with something like rows which tend to be most challenging at shortened positions, lengthened partials may better develop the traps. As for the pecs, many exercises that train them are already challenging at moderate to lengthened positions even with a full range of motion, so lengthened partials may not be needed. Overall, this is a fascinating hypothesis, but it remains just that, a hypothesis. So what's the overall verdict? To get as close to the truth as possible, we require a large quantity of quality data, but we're unfortunately not there yet. This frustratingly leaves us unable to conclusively say which possibility is true. Even with this being the case, I think there are some general and flexible recommendations we can arrive at. Based on what we have, I feel fairly confident that training the calves with length and partials is a good idea. But for other muscles, the first option is just to stay with the standard way of training all other exercises with a full range of motion. The second option is to experiment with length and partials where you personally wish to. Remember that no study to date has actually found length and partials to be inferior, 
so they may very well be compatible with maximizing hypertrophy. This doesn't necessarily have to be every set or exercise, perhaps in just some sets. The third option is to experiment with post-failure partials. Of course, we've just seen evidence that post-failure partials may not be superior with the calves, but since we don't have data with other shortened position challenge exercises, it remains a possibility that post-failure partials are useful, and they generally can be quite convenient in some cases. For example, on the final set of rows, pulldowns, or lateral raises, it can be quite satisfying to squeeze out several extra partial reps. If you're looking for an exceedingly effective customized muscle building program, our exceptionally rated partner, the Alpha Progression app, can help you. No other app gets close to creating personalized programs as comprehensive and well-rounded. Input key details, such as what equipment you have, if you want to emphasize some muscles more than others, and how often and how long you're able to train for. This generally takes less than a minute. The training philosophy is based on the latest scientific literature, but further customizations can easily be done, reorder, swap out, remove, or add exercises. Change any training variable or add things such as supersets. During workouts, there's a built-in warm-up set calculator and rest interval timer. Track each set with the app, and the app also provides progressive overload recommendations to assist you, and there's a nice workout summary at the end. Of course, the app automatically logs and displays your progression across time. If you're unsure about exercise technique, there are straightforward video and text instructions on over 600 exercises. The reviews from tens of thousands is a testament to its exceptional quality, but we would love to know what you think. The link in the comments and description gives you a free two-week trial plus 20% off a subscription if you do continue. Thank you for making it to the end. Feel free to check out another one of the videos at the House of Hypertrophy.